Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, it's uh, great to see you here. Lovely to see so many of you. I've had such a warm welcome in Wheaton. It's, it's been amazing, and uh, I really enjoyed uh, giving the lecture last night. But it's good to gather here. Let me, it's not going to be my central text from this, but let me just say uh, a verse from this reading that certainly brings me a word of comfort. It's a verse that occurs more than once, actually, in the New Testament. And that verse, of course, is from uh, 10 and verse 6. They did not understand what he was saying to them. I take, that, in this case it's the Pharisees, but I take comfort. The best of the disciples don't understand. They had no idea. And they say, he said this, but they didn't get it at the time. After he died and rose, then they begin. So I always feel like, oh, I'm in good company, you know, at least. That's why I always, I, I always um, love so-called doubting Thomas. You remember when Jesus says, uh, you know, I'm going to prepare a place for you. You know the way to where I'm going. And you can see all these disciples, you know, stroking their beards, looking into you know, and it's, uh, they have absolutely no idea. <laughs> but they don't want to be the first person to say, I don't get it. <laughs> so Thomas says, we do not know the way. <laughs> no way. We do not know where you're going. How, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? <laughs> Jesus loves that. Any good teacher loves the kid who asks the question and actually lets you know that they don't get it. That's the first step. And of course, because Thomas asked that question, we get one of the great I am sayings. Jesus replies, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, through me. So that's one of the great I am sayings. You know, there are seven great I am sayings in John's gospel. And they're called the great I am sayings because in the Greek, he says, ego amy. Now, in Greek, because it's an inflected language, you don't have to have the, the ego. You can just say, amy, I am. But when he says, ego amy, it's like, I am in capital letters. And it's a riff, isn't it? On the name of God, on what Yahweh means. You know, when Moses asked that big question of, uh, of God at the burning bush, it's such an important question that he does that thing you do when it's really important, it really is for you. You say, like, um, I'm just asking for a friend, you know, it's not... Uh, do you remember he says, if I go to the children of Israel and say, the, the, the God of Jacob and Isaac has, has sent me, and they say to me, what's his name, what, what should I say? <laughs> and that's when the Lord discloses his name from eternity to eternity. And what does it turn out to be? It turns out to be, I am the consciousness, the personhood. Coleridge said, you're either going to say that the first statement in the world is it is, and it's just dead stuff, and you're going to try and figure out how we got minds and personality. You'll never get there. Or you can begin with I am, and say I am spoke it is into, be into being. So I am sayings, ego amy. And I am the way, we got that from Thomas, good old Thomas, as I call him in one of my poems, courageous master of the awkward question. <laughs> That's what every student should be. So we get two, double bonus in a short passage from John, we get two of the seven I am sayings that are distributed across the whole of John's gospel in this short passage. We get, you had it here as uh, I am, I am the gate of the sheep. My translation has, I am the door of the sheep. And then he repeats it again, I am the door. And then we get, I am the good shepherd, two of the great ones. Now, let's go back to that. They didn't understand what he was saying to them. <laughs> so you're in good company. It might help you to get what's going on in this passage of John, which starts with the door the, uh, the one who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. He calls them by their name. They know the voice of the shepherd. They won't follow strangers. And then later on, this strange thing where not only does the shepherd enter by the door, but he says, I am the door. And they're separated from verse 6 to 7. Let me just tell you something that might help you with that. In uh, the Holy Land in that time, in the time of Jesus, in the hills and towns and in Nazareth, there were two kinds of sheepfold. In the little township or village, there was one big common sheepfold that everybody had put up together. And all the sheep of that village were kept there. 
to whichever family they belonged. They were all, and Matt had a proper gatekeeper and they could, you know, they hired somebody to do that. And it was fully roofed and housed against the elements and the sheep just stayed in there. And then every morning when the sheep, the sheep had to be taken out from that, because pretty soon in the beginning of the season, they'd exhaust any green pasture around the village and the different shepherds had to take them out along the, the wadis, the, the little narrow shadowed valleys with the tiny path lead them out to a higher pasture. And eventually they'd have to go further and further to get the good grass. So when they started in the morning, all the shepherds, and they were usually the, the runt of the litter, to be honest. The shepherd boy was like the last kid in the family. Oh, yeah, well, little Joey. Oh, okay, fair enough, he's out tending the sheep. You remember when they bring, when Samuel goes to look for David and all the big, strong, tough football playing sons come out and says, no, it's not the one. And this, oh, well, there's little David. <laughs> you know, but David's up with the sheep. You wouldn't want him. <laughs> and lo and behold, it's, so it's usually the little kid. And all these kids would come down and they'd, you can imagine them all calling, but the sheep knew their individual shepherd. They knew that voice. So that's, that's the image of the first one. The gatekeeper opening, the shepherd coming in, the walls built up to stop the, the, the thief from climbing in. Okay, for a few weeks at the beginning of the season, you could make it back to that sheepfold every night. But there would come a time when you had to go up into the higher pastures and it was more than a day's journey. So the shepherd would have to spend time with the sheep out on the sheepfold. And uh, what they had was a series of almost kind of makeshift um, little sheepfolds. And what they were, we've uncovered them uh, archaeologically, they were a ring of stones. They didn't have a full roof, but they were high enough wall that a sheep can't jump over, basically. A ring wall. And then there was no question, of, because there's no roof, there's no question of hanging a door there. There was a gap. And the shepherd would, at the end of the day, when they finished, go bring the sheep into the safety of this fold that they couldn't jump out of. And then what he would do is he himself would lie down across the gap. He would close the gap with his own body. That way he would know, like if any sheep was going to stray, and separate, they were going to have to step out over him. Uh, but equally, if any wild animal or thief was going to come in, they had, would literally, he was quite, it's not, was almost no metaphor, he was quite literally the door. So he says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. The sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And then having said, I am the door, he moves on to say, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I think two other scriptures are summoned up there. One prophetically from before, one from after this moment, but opening it out. The one from before, well, we mentioned David, the shepherd lad. He was in a position to know what shepherding was. He'd done it since he was a kid. And he writes the 23rd Psalm. And he says something, frankly, astonishing. We tend to read that Psalm, beautiful, comforting, lead me, you know, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down and still, he leads me beside still waters. He comforts my soul. He spreads a table before me. It's lovely, gentle, encouraging. But it has that extraordinary verse. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. I didn't understand that verse, although I should have understood it, but I'm, in the, I'm definitely in verse 6, they didn't understand. I, I should have understood it from this. Do you remember it says that the shepherds, when they, when they speak to the sheep with their voice, they lead them out? But my mind was full of English and Scottish shepherding. We have a program on English TV called One Man and His Dog, in which you can watch sheepdog trials, and you see these brilliant shepherds you know, with just like one dog or maybe two dogs and the sheep are all over the place and the competition is with the whistles and calls, they drive the sheep in front of them and they get them penned into the fold. It's beautiful. 
I love that. I, part of my Scottish heritage is to do with Scottish hill farming and sheep farming. And my mum used to stay up in Loch Lemon when she was a little girl, and in an old shepherd's both in. She really loved the shepherd of that farm. And he had two sheep dogs, and one of them was called Goodness, and the other was called Mercy. <laughs> because goodness and mercy all my life shall surely follow me. <laughs> and so, so my mum used to think of God's goodness and mercy as being like a sheepdog's unit. You know, so that's where my image came from. But that's not how they did it in the Holy Land. I only discovered how they did it in the Holy Land when I was walking with my wife. In, we went to visit Israel in the, in, 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 in the 80s, in the mid-80s. It was quite a difficult time to be there. But I, we were walking along in the Judean wilderness along the Wadi Kelt. We thought we were on our own, walking, picking our way along this narrow path with a drop down one side and a height above and the sun just going down behind it and the shadow cast across this little path, picking our way, as we thought, on our own. And I started hearing this weird kind of slightly scratchy, scrawny pipe music. And from around the corner comes this little Palestinian shepherd boy, couldn't have been more than 10 or 11, playing a pipe. And picking their way carefully after him is about a dozen scraggy sheep. And he's leading them to a higher pasture. And you can see the sheep don't much like the look of it. They're kind of uh, going along like this. But OK, if he can get there, I can get there, you know. He's the guy that's led me to pastures before. And I suddenly got it. I thought, oh, my goodness. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. But then I thought, how could David, the shepherd boy, have known that that could be God? The Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. How can that be? There's only one way that God could lead me on that dark shadow journey from my death through the valley of the shadow of death. The only way he could do that would be if he himself died, if he himself went through the grave and gate of death. Prophetically, somehow, David knows that will happen. How far he also knew that it would happen through the son of David, Hosanna to the son of David, to the king of kings, that one day Jesus would come and completely fulfill that prophecy and say, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He lays down his life because there's one more pasture he's got to take us to. And he needs to pioneer that path. He goes through that agony and through the grave and gate of death so that we don't have to go through it alone. We will not make that journey alone. We will reach out for a hand and we will know him and he will know us because all this time, right now, we've been singing in these chapels, even if they're sometimes tough to get to and there's other things and I know the pressures of student life, but you're coming here and you're hearing his voice. You're training your ears to hear the voice of the Good Shepherd. Because one day you're going to make that journey. And you will do so in hope and trust and confidence because you are with somebody who has pioneered the path. So that's the scripture that goes before, I am the good shepherd, the Lord's my shepherd. But I want to, to just uh, mention one other one. I find you've been singing, I love that song you sang at the beginning about the lamb. He is the lamb. Now here, poets, I'm a poet, poets love paradox. The most stunning paradox ever in the book of Revelation. And the lamb upon the throne, that's already a paradox, the lamb, the little lamb, the one who was slaughtered is now the king. The lamb, but get this, the lamb upon the throne will be their shepherd. The lamb will be their shepherd? Wait a minute. No, I know, that works, that works, why? Because we have the only shepherd. This is why he's the good shepherd. We have the only shepherd who still knows what it's like to be a lamb. We have a leader who has been led. We have one who rules, who has served. I'll tell you what's gone wrong with a lot of shepherding in the churches. A lot of shepherding where it turns out to be wolves in sheep's clothing is that they have forgotten what it is to be a lamb. They're not interested in the lambs anymore. Hey, I'm a shepherd. I don't have to worry about this, but the lamb upon the throne will be their shepherd. That's what makes the good shepherd the good shepherd. But I want to conclude not with that second of the two I am sayings we did, had today, I am the good shepherd, but with the first. 
because for a long time I was looking for the door. I lost my faith when I was a teenager. It took me a while and it was in my college years that thanks be to God, I came back to it. I tried a lot of doors. The best door I found was uh, at the back of a wardrobe and <laughs> that led me into Narnia. That was a good one, that really helped. That really helped. And I became interested in doors themselves, in liminal spaces, in places of transition. So eventually this saying of Jesus, I am the door, became the one that opened the door for me. So I'm going to conclude with a poem I wrote. I wrote a sequence of seven poems on the seven I am sayings. Let me finish by reading you this one on John 10:7. Maybe it will ring some bells for you. I thought I'd think about all the other doors before we get to this one. About the doors that were closed on them in Bethlehem. The doors that maybe Jesus made himself when he was learning the craft of a carpenter. But then finally he becomes the door. I am the door of the sheepfold. <clears throat> Not one that's gently hinged or deftly hung. Not like the ones you planed at Joseph's place. Not like the well-oiled openings that swung so easily for Pilate's practiced pace. Not like the ones that closed in Mary's face from house to house in brimming Bethlehem. Not like the one that no man may assail that waits your breaking in Jerusalem. Not one you made, but one you have become. Load-bearing, balancing, a weighted beam to bridge the gap, to bring us within reach of your high pasture, calling us by name. You lay your body down across the breach, yourself the door that opens into home. May we together go through that door. Amen.